Buying quality foods and drugs was a challenge at the turn of the 20th century. Flour might be contaminated with insect parts, while sugar might be laced with sand or saccharin. Many foods were of poor quality and few were accurately labeled. Likewise, many drugs were not potent, effective, or safe, and patent medicines contained mostly alcohol, often with an opium derivative added. Consumers were none the wiser because neither food nor medicine labels were required to list their ingredients. After 27 years of debate, Congress enacted the 1906 Pure Food and Drugs Act, the first federal law to protect consumers from fraudulent, adulterated, and mislabeled foods and drugs. It required labeling to be truthful on foods and drugs and set some initial standards for drugs. However, the law was unable to stop false advertising or protect consumers from the dangers posed by other products, such as unsafe cosmetics or fraudulent devices. New technologies brought new products and ingredients to contend with, as well as alluring new marketing methods, such as radio advertising. New beauty, new youth, new them. By the 1930s, many of the law's shortcomings had become obvious. FDA decided it was time to educate the public about the limitations of the law. Ruth Lamb, FDA's chief education officer, and George Larrick, FDA's chief inspector, were instrumental in creating a traveling exhibit of dangerous and deceptive products that the agency was unable to remove from the market. In the summer and fall of 1933, the exhibit, dubbed the American Chamber of Horrors by the press, made its way across the country, including the 1933 World's Fair in Chicago, drawing the public's attention to the need for a new food and drug law. Under the 1906 Act, it was virtually impossible for FDA to prosecute unsafe or fraudulent drugs. The agency was not authorized to remove inherently unsafe drugs from the market. And in order to prove that a drug was fraudulent, it had to demonstrate that the manufacturer knowingly misled consumers. Since the law did not cover promotional materials, manufacturers could simply move their false claims to their advertising to avoid labeling requirements. And there was no provision allowing FDA to act against inherently dangerous drugs. One example was Banbar. This was a worthless product consisting of a variety of chemicals and plants that was marketed as a cure for diabetes at a time when insulin injections were widely available and effective. In court, the product's proprietor presented testimonials from consumers claiming they had benefited from Banbar. FDA countered with death certificates from the same people who had died from diabetes. But FDA could not demonstrate that Banbar's maker knew he was defrauding patients, and so the product continued to be sold. Marmola was a popular cure for obesity, and like many similar products, it relied on dried thyroid hormone. It was heavily advertised, especially on the radio. Starvation diets are no longer necessary. You'll hear how Marmola, based on modern science, using the factors employed by modern doctors. Unfortunately, no one ever heard that Marmola could trigger classic symptoms of hyperthyroidism rapid heart rate, and insomnia. Since obesity was not considered a disease or a medical condition at the time, Marmola remained on the market. Radithor claimed to treat impotence and dozens of other serious diseases. It made headlines when Congress began an investigation following the slow and painful death of Eben Byers, a prominent businessman and athlete. Buyers consumed hundreds of bottles of Radithor for years, 
and suffered the effects of radium poisoning, including bone disintegration. Since Radithor was accurately labeled as a radioactive water, it was legal under the 1906 Act. The Great Depression left half of the U.S. population either unemployed or underemployed, so that food became a national preoccupation. And for the FDA, the need to maintain the integrity of the food supply had never been more challenging. The pressure for low-cost foods was so great that many manufacturers were forced to sacrifice both quality and nutrition to sell food as inexpensively as possible and some unscrupulous vendors resorted to trickery. Consumers were the unwitting victims of deceptively packaged foods that concealed substandard and underweight products. But honest food manufacturers who couldn't compete with rock-bottom prices also suffered, many of them going out of business. An already dire crisis over food quality became even more so. Strawberry bread spread was not really jam, but the consumer did not know this because it looked like jam and the label illustration made it look like any other fruit preserve on the shelf. It lacked any nutritional value, however, since it had no fruit or fruit juice. Its sole ingredients were pectin, artificial coloring, and flavoring, plus some grass seeds to mimic strawberry seeds. Chicken in a jar was a nutritious product, but consumers were deceived when the only white meat in the jar was a thin veneer surrounding dark meat, which was covered by the product label. Pure flavor extracts like vanilla and lemon were expensive. Consumers recognized this bottle as one holding two ounces of extract, but these bottles had thickened glass sides and held only one ounce. The pretty product label covered the deception. After the First World War, the popularity of glamour magazines and Hollywood movies spurred enormous growth in the cosmetics industry. But FDA had no authority over these products because they weren't part of the 1906 law. Manufacturers could use dangerous ingredients and make outlandish claims without fear of reprisal. Many cosmetics products included toxic chemicals like mercury, lead, and silver but there were no labeling requirements, so consumers were unaware of the dangers. Consider Karimlu, sold as a cream to remove unwanted hair from the face and body. Its chief ingredient, thallium acetate, could cause baldness, muscle and nerve damage, and even permanent paralysis. Ozine was a skin lightening cream and freckle remover that contained mercury. While it was highly effective in bleaching skin, mercury was well known to be dangerous, potentially leading to kidney damage, mouth ulceration, and tooth loss. Some fatalities were also linked to the high doses of the metal. Lash Lure was a dangerous aniline or cold tar-based dye used as an eyebrow and eyelash tint in beauty salons. The Journal of the American Medical Association reported more than a dozen cases of severe harm linked to the product. Eyelash and eyebrow loss, scarring, vision impairment, and in at least one case, irreversible blindness and disfigurement. In the 1920s and 30s, gadgeteers using new materials and manufacturing methods, along with extravagant advertising, forged a market for devices of dubious therapeutic value. Unfortunately, the 1906 Act was completely silent on medical devices. The pandiculator and the natural body brace were quack devices promising to correct poor posture and enhance overall health. Instead, 
They could cause orthopedic and respiratory problems. The Perfect Breather claimed to cure snoring, alleviate head colds, and beautify at the risk of suffocating in your sleep. And the Will Hyde Exhaler falsely promised to cure tuberculosis and other pulmonary diseases. These scandalous products and many, many others made it clear that the 1906 Pure Food and Drugs Act was not effectively protecting the public health. The nation needed a stronger federal law, yet it would take another five years of debate, dispute, and compromise to usher a new bill through Congress. In the end, outrage over a public health tragedy in which more than 100 people died after taking a toxic sulfa drug finally convinced Congress to pass the 1938 Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, strengthening FDA's powers of consumer protection and safeguarding the public health. From that point on, FDA would have authority to regulate the safety and labeling of not only food and drugs, but medical devices and cosmetics, as well as the powers to establish food standards and certify artificial colors. The act also prohibited deceptive packaging of foods and false therapeutic claims for drugs and required that drugs be proven safe before they could be sold to consumers and that they be labeled with accurate directions for safe use. Though it would be amended well over a hundred times in the eight decades after its passage, the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act has served as the bedrock of FDA's legal authority ever since. The 1938 Act is still the law of the land, and the American Chamber of Horrors helps us remember why. <laughs>